Hello, scholar friends. Um, Spanish period in, in California history. I want to sort of summarize this period, okay? Basically, you know, 1767, 1768 is when San Diego, the expedition heads out. 1769 is when San Diego is founded. 1770 to Monterey. So we started around there. And uh, in 1810s begins this slide in which uh, Spain is much less involved and, and the Mexican uh, independence is happening and oh, it takes a 10 year period or so. But there's sort of an arc there. 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, things are really, really getting going there. It's 1800, 1810, there's uh, Indian diseases, uh, strike hard plagues, there's some falling apart, some problems. But fundamentally, uh, you know, if we look to especially the time of Philippe de Neve, who's our favorite governor of this period here, we see a time of, of real flourishing. And and it's the fl best California flourishes under the Spanish. Remember, yes, Spain, it's the far edge of their empire. It's just the corner of the upper part of the Pacific. Uh, but it's, uh, we want to look at it and see it as aspirational, see that there's this California aspiration that, that comes out of a Spanish ideal, which is called the Pax Hispanica. Pax meaning peace, uh, the Spanish peace. It comes from the old Roman, Roman Empire, the Pax Romana, this language in Latin of, of empire. And so we want to we have a softer view of looking at empire. Uh, most of us are taught that empire is an evil word. Uh, and we're going to run into several words here which have these sort of dark interpretations, but are not meant to be dark. And so uh, we want to sort of see that aspirational aspect. Now, aspirations always fail always fail. We're human, we're sinful, we're just screw-ups. But aspirations always fail. But it's, it's a way to understand things. It's not the only way to understand, but it's a, a way to understand history if you focus on the aspirational, if you sort of see the aspirations and then try and figure out what, what went wrong and that sort of thing. Don't start from the bottom and then, then some people are cynical and the aspirations don't e even exist. Well, you know, let's, let's leave that to the cynics. All right. Uh, so what I want to talk about is, is and, uh, you know, I'm summarizing here material that we've already talked about. We've gone through examples with Cabrillo and voyages of, you know, and, uh, Juan Crespi going up the coast in the Portola expedition. We've seen lots of encounters with Indians and stuff. But let me just give a sort of generic here and uh, just to uh, sum this up before we move into the Mexican period of California history and a whole different set of ideals. Okay, so you have uh, four institutions, which are the dominant way that uh, the empire was going to unify and organize the coast of Alta California, the coast of California. Uh, Spain, had, um, uh, you know, this is, this is something that they didn't plan on making money. There's an old ideal of gold, God, and glory or something like that. French were fish, furs, and faith, and Spanish are gold, God, and glory. Uh, no, uh, they, there's no plan for gold in California. Gold rushes later. No plan. Uh, if anything, it's going to cost money to to come up into California like it did in Arizona. So, so we need to be able to plan these institutions. So ranchos are the ones that uh, we have spent the least amount of time on. And that's the ones that the Spanish did not like much. More Mexicans created, the Mexicans created more ranchos. The Spanish created some ranchos. Ranchos are people who live off, off doing their own things. They're like a plantation, a bit of a wild card. If you're trying to organize things and keep things solid and keep things going well, nah, plantations are always a wild card, okay? So ranchos are created, but not, not, the, uh, not the goal. And they're, they're certainly not what we want to build society off of. Pueblos is the highest value here. Pueblos is where church and state are together, okay, and are working together. We'll talk a little bit more about this. And so Pueblos are where people flourish, human flourishing in the ideals of, of Aristotle and on through the ideals of the empires of Rome and, and on into the Spanish. It's human flourishing happens in Pueblos. So we'll get to this term civilizing. To civilize, to be civilized, is to flourish as a human. 
So uh, that's the goal. That's what we want is pueblos. And there were two pueblos that dominated. One was here in San Jose. And the other was here in Los Angeles. These are the two that flourished the most. A later one is created up here in Santa Cruz. But ultimately, the plan was is that pueblos would be everywhere, especially the Indians. Uh, the mission lands would, would uh, be, uh, become Indian pueblos. Now, uh, the missions themselves, like we we're pointing out here, the missions are, um, are central to the plan, the evangelizing, but at the same time, they are temporary. They're supposed to come and go. So missions will disappear. So you have ranchos, we don't like them so much. Pueblos, yes. Missions will disappear and presidios will uh, act as a type of, um, you know, political, geopolitical chess piece. Okay, that no, no presidio is built in such a way or, or manned in such a way that it can actually protect the coast of California. They simply are on a map and people can point to them in Europe or something like that and say they're there. They can't really do anything in California. Okay, so Pueblos is the key. And the idea here is that the Indian population will benefit. Indian population will flourish. We know that this doesn't happen. We know that there's harsh times, and especially with the disease of syphilis that sort of spreads unhealthiness so deeply and, and it, uh, into society. It's not just a sexual disease. It's... It, it just spreads into everything. And then that would de, de, you know, weaken the population. And then you'll have uh, like measles or smallpox come through and decimate large populations. And so, so Indian population does not flourish. But it's not for the fault of the politics, the ideals of the system. Okay. Now, I suppose you could hope that the Spanish just never came. We left the Indians here. Uh, it is just not going to happen in the world. I don't, I don't know if uh, we, we, part of what we're talking about today is, is whether we have utopian ways of viewing things or whether we sort of try and understand as best we can people trying to do good within a bad situation. Okay, so this is the way we're going to start. Uh, also, I wanted to uh, add in that there are there's a lot of ecological issues here with the otters, but mostly I want to point out this explorers as we talk about the emperor, the empire. Okay, the empire, you know, it spreads up way north. Once you get above San Francisco, the Spanish have not created the settlements. Their plan was, you know, pueblos, missions, presidios, you know, stuff like that. But so they had no real. This line is sort of fake. We don't know where this line was. The Spanish themselves, and this is very interesting, had aspirations to go all the way up through Alaska and stuff, and they had a, uh, 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 you know, uh, not a settlement, but they had come to Nootka Sound, and this is where they'll meet the British and have to discuss whether they're going to keep, be able to keep their, their property in the north or what they claim in the north, but what they can hold on to and what they agree to at the Nootka Sound is that the Spanish Empire goes up just north of San Francisco Bay. Russians are coming down here and will, in 1812, set up Fort Ross, okay? So, you have this empire. Now, the empire, this is very... Imp California is a maritime coast. It's a maritime empire. It's sort of obvious because we are a coast, but people talk about, I don't know, people walking in uh, El Camino Real and stuff like this. But the way people got around and the way uh, most colonists came and, and the way most uh, goods and stuff came was through ships, these packet boats. And so there's a, there's a maritime empire. And show, to show you the sort of seriousness of the empire by Spain was is that they built here near Tepic down here a port specifically set up to support the coast of California, and then it's the missions of Presidios, and then to send explorers all the way up and further on uh, colonization, uh, in, uh, hopefully, you know, up to Seattle and stuff that never happened. But, but here this port, and it's called San Blas, and the port and these uh, ships 
were paid for by this, uh, not paid for completely, but subsidized heavily by what we call a pious fund for the Californians. And it was set up in Europe by the Jesuits, taken over by the Franciscans and the state, um, the government, and used for religious state purposes, which was the, you know, the evangelization and civilization of, of the coast of California. Okay, and so uh, a, uh, a, a, you know, a, an endowment of prayer and money was infused deeply into the creation of a, a maritime network of ports and anchorages and boats all linked and tied down to San Blas here near Tepic, okay? And you can see why they have it down here so that they can shoot up. And that's a hard sail to shoot up, but, but the thing is, is uh, they're not, you know, they're tacking all the way up. But the thing is, is that you have a, a, a very serious concern that begins in 1767 for a new type of well-coordinated coastal corner of the Spanish Empire. And California is, a, is the center of that endeavor, and it is highly aspirational. A lot of good governors, Bucarelli, uh, Galvez, these are, the, these are people who, who are not bad people. They're not there to gold. They're not there to exert sort of power and push the Indians out. They're there because uh, fundamentally the ideals of the empire is, is uh, spreading the Pax Hispanica, spreading, the, uh, spreading a type of, of beneficial system. Now, of course, we're gonna make money and of course we're gonna have the power to defend ourselves. But on the other hand is that no one's coming to California for gold, you know? They're coming for, to California to do something else. And uh, this is uh, Bodega, and Bodega goes all the way up the coast and comes down. But this is the book about him, The Far Reaches of Empire, the life of Bodega. And let's talk about this empire. And it's, it's a word that has a bad rep, um, largely because it's been used for a lot of bad things. Uh, imperialism is to stick an ism on the end of the word, is to is to create a, uh, what most of us take as a harsh thing, cultural imperialism, economic imperialism. It's a, it's a type of pejorative, it's, it's, it's bad. Not necessarily, okay? It is often, but not necessarily, okay? So this is the thing, what, uh, what I'd like to point out here is the most important aspirational terms used by empires, especially in the Roman imperial tradition, okay? Which is certainly, the Spanish tradition, which is uh, first and foremost friendship. <laughs> hey, you go back and you look at the uh, at the documents in Rome about like the you know when we've just conquered a place. You know the documents the governor would be told to f build friendship. Okay, and uh, the same word gets used in different languages, and in the Spanish it comes up here, and the uh, explorers Cabrillo. Uh, by Mendoza tells him, and then Bucarelli is telling to, to, uh, to uh, the ship that he sends out, like Juan Perez, who's this captain who goes up and down the coast of California all the time. Your job is to create friendship. The Indians are being hospitable. You are to be friends. We're to create a relationship here, a mutually beneficial relationship. We don't have to place super high values on this friendship. We don't have to be buddies or anything, but we're going to have a mutually beneficial relationship. One that has full of hospitality. Now, of course, the goal is that you're going to be participating in things like that. But the thing is, is that uh, we are offering a uh, something that we believe is a good that if we all participate in, you will benefit too. Okay. So yeah, certainly uh, there's aspects of this that are badly, but think in terms of friendship, okay? Think in terms of that's, you know, of, of all of these ship captains of, of Porta Law, all these people be told to create friends, okay? Uh, if you watch Star Trek, it's at least like those guys. They, you know, good intentions are full of all that. So, you know, to boldly go where no man has gone before and create friends. Don't screw, screw them up. 
Now, civilization, this also, oftentimes, civilizing is a type of harsh word. It doesn't have to be, it sometimes is. It's basically the idea of the kiwis, the civ, which is the uh, Latin term for the stuff of the city, to the good stuff. It's, it's a term for what we would think of as a, a town. And the uh, normal way to perceive it was as a type of household town, okay? So, uh, or a town filled with households. And, and it would work in a sort of very dynamic way. So, let me just uh, show you real quick, is in, a, in the civilization, you know, the basic idea is that you have a plaza, a central common area, common space, and you have, you know, uh, your housing and your private property built around here. And then, you know, one aspect of this is the church. And if you go to the Pueblo of Los Angeles, you sort of see this. There's a plaza, and then there's the church right there. And that church is where education and all sorts of good stuff are offered. Uh, most of the people are being educated at some level towards the jobs that they do. It's a society that wants to be supportive and, and care for each other. You'll have people who are, are uh, weak members of this, the town and they're to be taken care of. Uh, then there's the powerful people and they're supposed to be <coughs> benevolent. And then you have the church there and it's going to be educational and salvation is going to be offered and all that sort of stuff. So it's a, it's ultimate human flourishing is in a political. This is where Aristotle says, Spanish believe completely, we're political animals. Individuals, you guys are crazy. Political animals, that's who we are. We're, we're part of friendship relations. We look out for each other. Our farm lots, you know, where we farm and make money is out here and we help each other harvest and stuff like that. But we're going to live together so that we can look out for each other, okay? So civilization is modeled that way, and that's the Pueblo, okay? So the town, the Pueblo, is the goal, okay? And so friendship and civilization are very, very important. Now, for the church and the evangelism, this term neophyte is very important. Uh, very important because it means, at its core, is that becoming a Christian for the Indians was a process. And it had to be a process built around their will. And it had to start with them wanting to be part of the mission. They're interested enough in Christianity to say, okay, I'm ready to learn my creeds. I'm ready to learn a little Spanish and Latin. I'm ready to sit and sing the songs and do the stuff. And maybe I'll get baptized. And if I'm baptized, I'm still a neophyte until I'm confirmed and stuff is that I have a longer period to, to think about. Am I doing the right thing? So it's fundamentally neophyte means a free will choice. We all know that that doesn't happen even in our own lives completely. But like, uh, for example, like a mom joins free will to the, to the mission or something like that, accepts the evangelism. She brings along her two kids. The two kids maybe grow up and they're baptized, they're technically neophytes, but they never made the choice themselves. So no, no mission is filled completely with people who free will love the mission. On the other hand, the missions in general overwhelmingly are filled with people who have decided to come there. There's a lot of uh, diseases that have been spreading for a long time. That syphilis has been around for a long time. Uh, and it's causing a lot of unhealthiness, a lot of sorrow, a lot of pain, a lot of death. And so Spanish uh, Catholicism does a good job of reaching out uh, to the sorrowful and reaching them where they're at. You know, so, uh, it, you know, suffering. Uh, the Catholic Church understands suffering real well in that crucifix. Where so, so, so you can understand why a lot of people would choose to be part of the missions. And so don't think that the, they herded up Indians and forced them on. As time moves on, there's a lot of different forces that work on Indians, but in general, the, it's a benevolent system. It is not a system which is designed to, to uh, enslave them or to 
to uh, force them into a situation which they are not going to at least ultimately benefit. Much like going to school today. We force kids to go till they're 16. Parents can be sent to, you know, arrested if they don't send their kids to school. All sorts of harshness about sending kids to school. Because why? Because it's beneficial. That's the sort of attitude, the structure behind this idea of a neophyte. So know well that this idea of a neophyte isn't, isn't aspirationally bad. It has been used for bad purposes, but not, not in any sort of structured normative system. Secularization is another term. Gotta know well. It doesn't mean what you usually think it means. It doesn't mean ending of Christianity. It means that a mission church, a mission structure, which is this large ranch sort of economic unit thing, uh, is going to be narrowed down, pared down into just a church. And so the missionary is going to move on and set up missions somewhere else. And what's going to be left is the church. And then all those lands and all those activities and Indians have been trained up into all sorts of jobs. Those will all fall together into, ideally, Pueblos. So that uh, there'd be uh, the vast majority of citizens in most Pueblos would be Indians. Now, in the situation of uh, the normal functioning Pueblo uh, that's going to come out of this secularization is that they are going to be civilized to the extent that there's popular sovereignty. Every, uh, every uh, town, every Pueblo is supposed to elect alcaldes, mayors, leadership, and also the uh, town council type of thing. And uh, De Neve, even to start this process to train Indians toward elections of representatives and things like that, uh, there was a law setting up that on each mission there needed to be elected two al Indian alcaldes. And these Indian alcaldes would have a type of management parallel role to the two friars, okay? Doesn't work out real well, but the thing is, is that it's a training idea for the ultimate Pueblo, okay, for the ultimate secularization. So secularization is actually a good thing that everybody wants because secularization means that the mission has accomplished its goal, moved off, missionaries have gone to do more missionary work, priests have taken over, and Pueblos are, are, are flourishing and a new sort of popular sovereignty is is a, being uh, developed, okay? People are looking after themselves. And so this is, the, this is the sort of a grand plan. It's a really sort of powerful plan. And it comes out of an older world view, which is Aristotelian, and, and, um, but had proven to be very, very strong uh, all over Europe and, you, you know, and, uh, influenced the Roman Empire and stuff which was this idea of, uh, of a type of, you have an emperor who's sort of, or a king or a queen that's sort of on top, the parents, and they oversee things, but then at the working levels of things, there's popular sovereignty and there's people looking after themselves and there's free will and there's human flourishing. So the empire isn't like a monolithic, you know, uh, Star Wars dark system, you know, of, everyone doing exactly what they're told. It's a very light system. And this is that notion of the Roman friendship, which is we want all of you to flourish. You can have your separate uh, languages. You can have your separate ways of doing things. We will all unify on some things, okay? Uh, probably the most harsh aspect, if you want to think of it that way, is the insistence on Roman Catholicism. But... You know, Roman Catholicism is not a harsh system. So, so the thing is that you're not talking human sacrifice or anything like that, you know, except for Jesus. The, uh, the thing is, 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 is you've got a, a household that is built around love. Everyone is supposed to love each other and look out for the best interest of each other, whether they be slaves even. Uh, or, but, you know, like we're talking about, they, they don't want slavery. Spanish doesn't want slavery. But the idea of the weakest members of society are taken care of. And then the um, rich take care of the poor, the strong take care of the weak. And it's, it's a, a human flourishing is going on. But it's a system based on love. Now, the thing that is not in here, there's almost zero, zero, zero 
emphasis on equality. Now, equality is something that was beginning. And remember, this is starting in the 1770s. And so a lot of parts of the Spanish Empire and even uh, the United States is being developed and England is a whole new wor world of republics. And Spain, Mexico is going to be heavily invested in republics. The uh, Republican ideal, heavy emphasis on human rights and equality, you know, so especially equal rights. And yes, there's many benefits to that. It's a type of, oh, to try and push it super hard is a, is a type of utopian vision. But what it does is it builds up a type of system which is checks and balances and fear of putting too much power into one place too long. And so there's term limits, checks and balances. And so it creates a type of harsh society in which you're not supposed to be looking out for each other. You're supposed to look out for yourself. You look out for your rights, they'll look out for their rights, and then good will happen in the long run. Whereas this is like, okay, everyone should be looking out for everyone else's rights. This is highly individualistic in its orientation. This is highly corporate or social in its orientation. This is the way the missions work. This was the way the Spanish Empire worked. And you may love this, but it's good to appreciate there that this, this is... No one dreamed uh, that this should, imperial system should be fundamentally oppressive, okay? It should be fundamentally moving toward human flourishing for all of its members, rich, poor, weak, strong, everyone. Now, uh, we have, of course, lived through all sorts of oppressive regimes in the 20th century, and so we have a hard time envisioning power being used in a sort of fatherly way. This is often called patriarchy. Uh, it's a type of parental system where the family is the model, where well, we've seen that used really badly in the 20th century. So uh, these are words to be careful with in life. These are words to train up our children with and stuff, if we're especially if we're teaching California history in the fourth grade. And then uh, they're especially important if you know, for our final and stuff like that, if we want to understand what the Spanish were trying to do in that sort of larger way. And we, I've given you plenty of examples. Now, I want to turn to one last example, and that's this woman, Apollonaria, Apollonaria Lorenzana. And uh, her story is, is uh, she gives it in this Testimonios book. And the thing about it, is that she puts, let's see if I can find out, where, where does that go? The, uh, uh, okay, here we are, is, this is a really interesting section, and how she is, she's an orphan woman, an orphan girl in Mexico, and this is the, I get, I, the weakest of a week in the big picture of life are orphans, okay? And so what do you do with an orphan girl? Well, that's, you know, all sorts of evils and stuff have taken place with that idea. So the Catholic, this is the Spanish Empire. Orphan girls get taken into the, uh, the church. And, uh, uh, and, and Apollonaria was, was raised in an orphanage in Mexico City until she's, she's educated, she's given confidence, she's, uh, you know, good girl. And then a bunch of them, a bunch of these orphans are then sent to Monterey uh, to be then distributed. And that sounds harsh to be distributed, but no, we're giving them homes. It's like finding foster families for people and stuff like that in our modern world. And then uh, these, everyone's supposed to be, nobody's supposed to impress. No one's supposed to create sex slavery or anything out of this. They're supposed to, be, and she then comes eventually under the, under the, um, employment of the mission here in San Diego. And as the mission in San Diego, she becomes the head of what we call a monherio. Now here, many of us in the modern world just, just cannot handle this monherio idea. It's where they take, especially the younger women, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old women, lock them up, guard them type of thing. 
and uh, it sounds like uh, something very sort of inhibiting of people's freedom, inhibiting of people's equality, all sorts of things. And it is, okay? But on the other hand, is when we try and picture that Apollonaria, who's a good woman, a wonderful woman, is the, is the house mother, if you want to call it, to the, this sort of women's dormitory. Uh, she is there to protect these young women from all this, the sexual abuse, the dangers of, of being out there among the, among the males of the Indians and, and the Spanish because, you know, young girls are taken deeply advantage of sexually in all societies. And, and so it's, this is to sort of protect them. It's a high value of marriage as a sacrament. You may not have that value, but you can appreciate that someone who does, marriage is a sacrament, it's the foundation for sort of the households and ultimately like this is the way all, all the cosmos is created is the grand unity that's bonded in you know, a marriage. So, so the thing is as a sacrament, it's very important that, that uh, women be given to monogamous relationships with good husbands. And so the management of that becomes a, you know, part, of, part of her job, Apollonaria. And then she, along the way, educates them, gives them skills, teaches them to read and write, all sorts of stuff. So, so the thing is, is, is this evil? Uh, you might just bristle at it, you know, why would these girls be so, you know, this is sexism and everything else. And it is, but it's, it's for purposes which are ultimately to serve human flourishing. If you don't believe it, it you, you can need to have sort of an empathy to understanding that the Spanish believed it. So that what you have is, is uh, the aspirations of the Spanish Empire as they come into this far corner of their world, which was settled very late, and they had a chance to... <clears throat> it was going slow enough, the colonization especially was going slow enough that they could manage the system so that a lot of bad things weren't happening real fast. All those bad things are going to happen real fast in the gold rush after the United States takes over because then things are unmanageable. But the Sp Spanish had aspirations of good management. When we look at the viceroys in, in Mexico, the who was sent up to, you know, especially Felipe de Neve, and uh, we see uh, 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 really an amazing level of cooperation between church and state. We see an amazing level of of, uh, of shared ideals. Of course, Sarah and Neve don't get along. I don't think Sarah, Sarah's pugnacious, but, but uh, Neve, you know, of course they don't get along. But that doesn't mean that the empire, imperial system isn't a system of friendship, uh, a system of mutual benefit, a system of civil society that was ideal, idyllic in its aspirations uh, for California.